Okay, strap in. Today's episode might be a little bit long because we have a new book. Um, shout out and thank you very much to Jeff in the comments uh, for suggesting some Australian Aboriginal tales uh, from their first people. And I appreciate your support and I'm sure it's in no way motivated by you being my father. So up front, we are listening to Wawi and Narita, the water monster and the water lily. And there were a couple of things I did want to address before we get started. Um, the first one, there's a song in here and it does not rhyme in English. I cannot sing nor develop any sort of melodies. So it will be more of a poem than a, a chant or a song. Uh, then there were a few words I wanted to define um, in the order in which they appear in the story. First one, old blacks. I bring this up because, especially in the United States, I think anything racial can be easily confused with racist. Um, to my knowledge, old blacks is a completely appropriate term for their like old wise folk because they are old and their skin is black. There you go. Um, and then water rush, depending on where you are located in the world, you might be more familiar with it as cattails or bulrush or reeds. I personally know it as cattails um, here in the US. And then bargy, which is an elderly woman or grandmother. I kind of get the idea it's a bit of an honorific. Um, and since the Barbie movie just came out, I am picturing this as an old, old withered Barbie um, you picture whatever you want, but that's what I've got going on up in here. Wawi and Narita, the water monster and the water lily. When they were a girl and boy, Narita and Berwain used to play beside a deep water hole. They used to dig in the muddy margin for mussels and never knew how angry they were making Wawi, to whom the hole belonged. There used to come often a roar of thunder, and when it was very loud, they used to drop their mussel shells and run home to their mother's camps. But they did not know that this roaring thunder was really Wawi's voice, threatening them with a flood if his muscle, muscle shells were not given back. For Wawi was the greediest of water spirits. He would allow no one to touch anything belonging to him. The old blacks knew that and had told the children never to go near his hole, but Narita and Berwain thought only that there were to be found the biggest muscles, so they used to steal away and play there until the thunder frightened them back. The time came when they were very sorry that they had not listened to the warnings given to them, but by then it was too late. A long while ago, soon after the time when fairy tales were born, the blacks knew that the world had been drowned by a big flood and only a few people saved. So when Wawi threatened to make another big flood and drown them all, they were afraid and avoided going near his watering hole, all but Narita and Berwain. Wawi could see up through the water. He used to watch them and he saw that Narita was growing into a young woman and he saw too how much Berwain cared for her. The more Wawi looked, the more he thought of Narita and one day he made up his mind that sometime he would steal Narita away from Berwain. Wawi was so clever that he could do all sorts of wonderful things, so he began to make his plans. All this time, Narita and Berwain grew fonder and fonder of each other, and only waited for Berwain to be made a young man that he might ask Narita's family for her. Whenever they could steal away unnoticed, they went to the haunted water hole, where they thought they were safe from prying eyes, knowing that all the rest of the camp were frightened to risk going near it. They little knew that the greedy eyes of the water monster were always upon them. One day, when Narita was waiting for Berwain, an old woman she had never seen before sat down beside her and began to cry bitterly. Now, Narita was a kind-hearted girl, and she felt sorry for that old woman. So she went toward her and offered her some nicely cooked yams she had, saying, You are hungry. See, I have food. Eat. I have no hunger. I cry to think of the destruction you have wrought to your tribe, and you seem so happy, and yet you must die with them, and your loved one, Berwain, too. Narita shrank back. She was frightened. Who was this old woman whom she had never seen, and who yet knew she loved Berwain, a secret she thought only he and she knew? But her curiosity was stronger than her fear. She must find out what the old woman meant. How have I harmed my tribe? Did you not always steal the mussel shells from the home of Wawi? Did he not warn you in his voice of thunder? Yet did you not steal in spite of warnings for your tribe? And now they, the innocent, and you, the guilty, must alike suffer. Cruel that you were to carelessly doom your people to destruction, and yet you offered me food. Would that I could save you. Kind Bargy, save me and save my people. Even let me perish rather than the tribes. Save them. Save Berwain and our people, please. True. There are other daughters of the tribe for him, but he stole with you. He too should suffer. No, let me suffer, me alone. 
Save the others, kind Vargy. Save them. Come here tomorrow at this hour, and I will tell you if it can be done. Huawei is raging in wrath below, declaring he will make a flood that will destroy the world again, and this time no one shall be saved. All, all will be drowned. But I will tell Huawei how you grieve for the wrong you did and would give your life to right it. As she finished speaking, the old woman turned into an eel and slid into the water hole. Then Narita knew she must be a witch, such as she had heard of, so instead of waiting for Berwain, she went home, sadder than ever before in her life, fearing she knew not what, yet fearing it intensely. The next day she went to the water hole, hoping that the day before had been a dream, but there sat the old woman. Kind Bargy, tell me, are Berwain and my people saved? asked Narita breathlessly. It depends on you. If, when I plunge into the water hole, you have the courage to plunge after me, then all may be right. Walby says you yourself must come and ask him this favor. If you fail to do so, he will lift his voice of thunder and call on his brothers, the rain winds, to blow up such a storm as never the world saw before, a storm after which not one living thing shall be left. Narita looked at the water hole, thought of the water monster, shuddered, and turned as if to go. Then came a distant rumbling of thunder. She looked toward the camp and thought of her lover and her people, sighed, turned to the witch, and said, Go, I will follow. Surely such an evil smile was never seen on a face before, but Narita was too sad to notice its malice before the witch was gone and an eel slid into the water. One more look at the water, one long shudder, one more look at the camp, one long last thought of her lover, one plunge, and Narita was gone. Later came Berwain to look for her, but all he found were her tracks coming to the water, but none returning. Then he knew Narita was gone, and he cried a death wail. The camp people heard him and wondered until they saw him return alone when he told them of the tracks he had seen. Wowie has seized her! Wowie, the water monster! they said. You will never see her again. My love is greater than his. He drew her into the water. My love shall draw her out, proclaimed Berwain. And every day Berwyn sat where he had seen the tracks of Narita, and lowly he chanted a love song. Here I wait for you, Narita. Love of my life, I wait. Here will I wait till you come. Come, my Narita, come. Who so supple of limb as you, Narita? Who so soft of eye? Curly your hair was, Narita, and so glossy your skin. None were like you, Narita, my Narita. Love of my life, I wait. Heart's blood I'd spill for you, Narita. Come, my Dorita, come. Day after day, Berwain sat and sang. The tribe said he was mad, mad from the loss of Narita. They were kind to him and brought him food, but he spoke no word to them, nor they to him. One day as he sang, watching the water, he saw it stir, and a little green leaf, like the palm of a hand, unfolded itself and spread on the water. Each day came another, then came a flower bud, which, as he sang, Heart's blood I'd spill for you, Narita. Come, my Narita, come. Opened into a beautiful water lily, which he thought smiled at him. Berwain jumped up and cried, It is Narita, my blossom. She has come for me. My waiting is over. I go to her. I go. And he plunged into the water. But Wabi would not have him there. He hunted him from the water hole. But Narita clung to him on the edge, and there he was changed into a water rush. And soon that pool was a mass of red water lilies, margined with green-stocked, brown-topped rushes. And always where the water lilies are, there, too, you may see the rushes. And if you gather water lilies, just for the old legend's sake, gather, too, a handful of water rushes, that Narita and Berwain may never be parted. The end. Okay, so tons of good commentary in this from the woman who compiled it, Joanna Lambert. Uh, she is apparently, or was, an Australian actress. I can't find much information on her. Um, but she did point out some really great parallels between this story and the actions and tales um, of Greek gods. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and skip that, actually, because you didn't tune in for Greek mythology. You tuned in for a different mythology. So we will first address um, Aboriginal ancestors, which Wawi and Narita and Berwain are, um, are not gods. They're just ancestors. They're just what came before. Um, it's a fine distinction, but a distinction that should be made. 
And as far as uh, parallels that I do want to address, they're the idea of a flood being used to cleanse um, is present in a lot of stories across a lot of cultures. Um, and I, I really like the perspective um, that the Aboriginal people have on this, where the flood um, can be a way of starting anew, or it's just the natural end of a cycle so that the next cycle may start. And I always have thought of the Phoenix, um, you know, they catch fire so that they can be reborn. Um, and it's interesting, kind of violent. And in this case, I actually find the water method to be more comforting, I guess. Um, Cause I can see that being not about destruction, but about cleansing. And I have a, a number of friends who have had to make some pretty big changes in their lives um, so that they can leave, live happily. And I just want to remind everybody who might be going through that right now, um, that your tears are water and they will cleanse away the old so that you can uh, start the next cycle. So for the overall morals lessons of this story, I've boiled it down in my head to stay in your lane and share. So stay in your lane um, is extremely important in Aboriginal culture um, because there are a lot of sites that you are not allowed to go um, if you haven't been initiated into a certain class, like maybe into adulthood, um, you just, you can't go there. And so it's instilled in children from birth to respect um, what is being handed down and places you should and should not go. For example, a watering hole that sucks people down into it, they're going to possibly develop a story um, so that it can be portrayed easily and remembered. Um, but just don't go by that hole. Like instead of putting up caution tape, they just say, hey, no one go at the hole. It's it's evil or, you know, here's what happened there. You're going to get sucked down by a water monster if you do not stay out of it. Um, and so when Huawei and Berwain were stealing away there, it's a much bigger deal than it would be if, say, you know, like they were in the U.S. and they went to like a lover's lane or something like that. Like they are not supposed to be here. And everyone in the culture knows that there are severe repercussions for disregarding that. Um, and then... Sharing is super important. Uh, while we got really mad about the muscles, because he's jealous and greedy, um, traits of water gods, I guess, that come up in other cultures, including Poseidon, anyway. Um, but the much bigger issue and lesson here is that Berwin and Narita were wrong for taking muscles and not sharing them with the community. Um, Aboriginal children are taught from birth on that you share everything with everyone without exception. Um, there's some cute little songs and stuff like that that are in this book. Uh, if anyone wants to hear a deep dive, I would be interested in doing that. Um, but yeah, there are apparently no words for possessive uh, forms in their languages. Um, it's not mine, it's ours. It's not my uncle, it's uncle me, direct translation. Um, and I love that. I The the question I want to leave everyone with today is, how would you feel about living in a society that prized sharing over all else? I can say I would love it. I have a really hard time not sharing um, when I have something like eating something at work when I don't have enough for the whole group is something that I've mostly gotten over, but I still struggle with occasionally. Um, sharing is fun and it's fair and it's awesome. So yeah, would you like it? as much as I would. So that's all I've got for you today. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Like, subscribe, comment, tell your friends, please, please, please. And uh, if there are any stories that you would like for me to do next um, or any parallels you saw, I want to hear about it. Till next time.